to um, welcome to our October Chips Method Seminar. Um, I'm very excited and privileged to introduce one of our own, Dr. Chun Ching Lin, who will be presenting with us with her work on implementation science, framework challenges, and multidisciplinary approaches. And before I turn the table over to Chun Ching, I wanted to kind of announce very important housekeeping stuff. So for faculty evaluation, for faculty like us and Chun Ching, it's important to uh, have evaluations from um, for presentations and talks. So it's kind of a, um, you know, it, it won't, so after the, after the talk, if you can kindly fill out the evaluation form and then I'll leave the envelope in the front so you can, and the um, faculty name and the presentation title has been already filled out. So making it easy for everyone. So I'll, I'll pass this around. You can fill it out now or you can fill it out after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> Should I start? No. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm very honored to be here to talk about uh, implementation science uh, framework challenges and multidisciplinary approaches. So uh, implementation science is a really new field and uh, attract a lot, of, a lot of attention recently. And um, I was really uh, fortunate to uh, receive a five-year uh, career development grant to study implementation science and uh, uh, inter intervention delivery. Uh, in healthcare settings. So, um, uh, so today's talk, I'm gonna uh, just uh, review like, what I have learned during uh, my study and uh, my uh, research design. But the research is currently ongoing, so I don't have any findings to present uh, today. So I'm just gonna talk about the design and me methodologies. Okay, so uh, first, uh, what is implementation science? So basically, uh, implementation science uh, studies the process that promote the transfer of evidence-based intervention into real-world settings. So as you know, the, uh, uh, the federal funding has been invented a lot to uh, develop some um, intervention projects, and uh, most of them have, has been proved to be effective, but uh, a very uh, lo low proportion has been actually uh, uh, implemented or disseminated into uh, real-world uh, applications. So, um, so basically, uh, uh, implementation science is also known as dissemination and implementation research. So as the name implies, it has two aspects. One is dissemination, uh, which basically means uh, spreading the evidence-based intervention to the audience in uh, targeted settings. And the second is uh, implementation. It seeks to understand how to effectively uh, deliver the evidence-based intervention within a particular setting. So, um, so implementation science is a really uh, broad topic. It lies in different stages of uh, intervention delivery. So in, in each stage, there is also uh, specific questions and uh, uh, related research activities. So um, uh, at the exploration stage, you have to identify the need of target settings and also assess if the intervention you are designing is actually a good fit for the system you are targeting. Uh, uh, at the installation stage, um, you have to find out the uh, 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 to uh, develop a detailed implementation plan, also uh, identify the uh, team and provide training to the team and um, define the responsibilities between the teams. So it's basically some uh, preparation work that you have to do. And uh, uh, at the implementation stage, uh, you have to keep uh, balance between adaptation and fidelity. 
So uh, fidelity here basically means uh, the, the level to which the intervention is implemented as it's orig originally designed. So the better fidelity, the better chance to achieve a desired outcome. However, <laughs> the every implementation, uh, every uh, intervention project has to be adapt adapted according to the cultural and uh, uh, contextual factors of the settings. So there is really a, a fine line between uh, adaptation and fidelity. Um, uh, the last stage is uh, expansion and scale bus stage. So you have to uh, uh, summarize the lessons learned and also study the uh, mechanisms to sustain the effort. Um, so there is a really a uh, substantial distinction in the philosophy between implementation science and the traditional efficacy trial. Uh, so, uh, so traditional efficacy trial is usually conducted under uh, laboratory conditions. Like in the ideal settings, you uh, have the tendency to include those uh, with higher level of adherence. But this kind of laboratory condition is hard to achieve in real world settings. So uh, for implementation science research, you basically have to uh, include uh, everyone, uh, in including those with a lower adherence level. And uh, also traditional efficacy trial usually use quantitative, quantitative method, but implementation science research uh, really need to use both qualitative and quantitative, uh, like a mix, mix method, uh, uh, method. And then uh, traditional efficacy trial uh, usually uh, use uh, random, uh, random, like, uh, random allocation of participants, but uh, in implementation science research, it's uh, because of some like as ethical issue or practical issues, it's um, hard to do like randomization. So um, you have to use some uh, natural experimental design or so-called quasi-experimental design, uh, which basically means the allocation uh, is not randomized. So um, traditional efficacy trial uh, used to control for the confounders. Uh, but in implementation science research, you have to take into account the, those moderators and mediators. And also efficacy trial focus on outcome, assessing the outcome of an intervention. But implementation science research uh, focus more on the process of achieving the outcome, you have to um, document the like system change and uh, like the process of system change and the reasons for such changes. And also, the traditional efficacy trial uh, focus more on internal validity, but implementation science focus more on external validity, uh, generalizability to other settings. So uh, there's uh, a few challenges facing implementation science research. Uh, first of all, it's a new field. So there's a <laughs> little consensus uh, on the uh, optimal scientific knowledge and the uh, terminology. And also there is a measurement issue. There is lack of agreement on the definition of constructs and measures. And um, it's a very com complex issue to study uh, because it involves like multi-level factors uh, from policy, like work workplace culture regulation, employees, tech uh, technology, etc. And also it involves like multidisciplinary uh, methodology include uh, from uh, economics, social science, public health, and uh, things like so. It's really uh, uh, multidisciplinary. 
uh, the most challenging I, I've been uh, facing is that it, because the, uh, the unit of analysis is like an intervention project or a setting, so it's just like some kind of rare disease. You have no way to achieve enough sample size. So th uh, that's why we need to uh, uh, look for uh, alternative uh, methodologies to study implementation. So uh, uh, no, the method I'm using uh, uh, completed randomized control trial to as a case to study uh, implementation. The uh, randomized control trial is called white coat warm heart. Uh, the main aim is to reduce um, service providers stigmatizing attitude towards people living with HIV. Uh, it's completed trial. It was conducted in 40 county level hospitals in China in two provinces. So uh, basically the intervention used a uh, popular opinion leader approach to identify and train uh, popular opinion leaders uh, from 40 county hospitals. And also we provide uh, universal precursion supplies to promote the uh, service providers self-protection. So uh, universal precursion supplies basically means uh, uh, gloves and masks, uh, yeah, that kind of supplies. So the outcome is uh, really uh, promising. Uh, it showed significant reduced projectical attitude and avoided intent towards uh, people living with HIV uh, at six and 12 months follow up. So, but the question remained. First question is that uh, uh, given this such promising uh, intervention model, uh, do the hospital uh, directors willing to adopt this model in their hospitals? This is the first question. The second question is that, that the outcome is actually heterogeneous across hospitals. Uh, some hospitals show result earlier than others, and also the result is more significant in some of the hospitals than other hospitals. So uh, my question is uh, why there are such differences? So I use two approaches to uh, answer these two questions. So for the first question, uh, the first question is uh, to model the uh, hospital gatekeeper's decision making. So I use a method called uh, conjoint analysis to answer this question. So conjoint analysis is a method used in mostly in market research and later being used in uh, research of individual uh, health behaviors. Uh, for example, Dr. J. Lee used conjoint analysis to uh, model the uh, like general population's uh, preference of uh, HIV vaccine. So I uh, basically borrowed this method to study the um, stakeholders' decision making. Uh, so uh, basically the idea is uh, for uh, interve uh, intervention, there is a bunch of features. Say for example, uh, uh, let me give you a, a simple example is that it, say for example you are buying a cell phone plan. A uh, cell phone plan has uh, say four important features that you want to consider. One is price, one is minutes, one is uh, reception, one is rollover plan. So if, you, uh, if I ask you individually, like if those four features are important to you, you are gonna say yes, every feature is important, right? So, um, so conjoint analysis basically uh, present these four features as a bundle uh, to um, force you to make a trade-off decision. So that uh, so that we can model like which features most influential in your decision making. So to uh, apply this uh, uh, conjoint analysis to implementation science, 
uh, we need to go through four steps. So first is to determine like uh, what kind of the, the, the features of the intervention model. Uh, we call it attributes here. And then, uh, s then the second step, it, once the attribute is determined, uh, uh, you have to uh, generate a conjoined scenario as a combination of those attributes. Then you present the scenarios to the respondent and ask them to rate the acceptability score of each scenario. Then uh, you do connect, uh, data analysis. So I'm go through uh, step by step. <laughs> um, so first, to assign attributes, uh, the attributes and their levels are determined based on the findings from literature review and also a formative study with the hospital directors. So uh, so far, I'm uh, so far I. Uh, identify seven attributes that's important uh, for their decision making. Uh, one is uh, if there is a, a sufficient administrative support, and what's the cost of intervention? What's a, like how many? Uh, what's a percentage if of personnel need to be involved, and uh, the format and duration of the training, and availability of support. And uh, if reducing stigma is a priority of their uh, setting. So uh, just to <coughs> keep things simple, uh, I assign two, level, two levels for each of those attributes. So uh, say, for example, for administrative support, two levels could be uh, minimum or maximum. The cost could be high versus low. So. So uh, basically, um, seven <coughs> attributes with two levels each will generate a total of 128 uh, different scenarios. But uh, it's, it's not possible to present all these 128 attributes to the respondents, right? So uh, just to avoid complexity, we use a method called uh, fractional factorial orthogonal uh, design to uh, reduce the number of scenario to eight. So uh, this step can be uh, realized using a size macro. So uh, the, the size ma macro is available online and it generates an output like this. So basically it tells you how to assign level of attributes to each scenario. So according to the output given by SAS, we uh, generate uh, eight scenarios like this. So please, um, you can see like for each attributes, there are four uh, scenarios with the preferred levels and four with unpreferred levels. Say so for example. Can we ask a question? Yeah. So did you just arbitrarily choose eight? How did you come up with the initial eight? In Once you enforced eight, then SAS gave you what this should look like. But how did you choose eight? You mean uh, eight scenarios? C2, question, point C2, to avoid complexity, uh -huh. you did the fractional fra mm -hmm. factorial to yield eight scenarios. How did you choose eight? Say, or for example. You know, yeah, you can was assign. Was eight arbitrary or was eight It's a, like a reasonable number to administrate. It's actually not a, it's, it's not an arbitrary number and it's, uh, it happens that with seven dichotomous, seven attributes, seven dichotomous attributes, um, eight scenarios basically represent the estimation of just the main effects. So if you want to look at mean effects plus the interaction between attributes, it would be more than eight scenarios. So for six attributes up to seven attributes, you would have uh, eight scenarios with just the main effects. And then if you have less than uh, six attributes, you would actually end up with <coughs> less than eight uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. So this is like a, a reflection of, uh, so there's a utility between 
the number of scenarios you want to generate to provide to uh, participants. If it's too many scenarios, uh, the decision making gets compromised, mm -hmm. it gets even more complicated, and also the um, conscious effort to make it into a dichotomous <coughs> level, two levels, um, it makes it, it makes the trade-off decision making easier, but at the same time, those two levels have to be meaningful. So, so where would I have gone, Jay, to find out that for main effects I can do it? Seven variables, seven factors, right, main seven. effects only, eight scenarios is enough. Where would I found that? Where would I go to find that out? So there's a literature that you can cite. Um, For the vaccine also. study, I right, think and you and guys have seven you also attributes seven. is just, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not arbitrary. It, it could basically, when you do um, qualitative in-depth interview based on literature, it happens that there are potentially seven important features of an intervention. Mm -hmm. It could literally be four, it could be two, and it's pretty iterative also, conjoint analysis. So once you do this one round of seven attributes, you find out that there's only like three features that are most important. Mm -hmm. So what, what you would end up doing for the next phase is instead of doing this full conjoint analysis, you can do this free choice phase analysis where you would only have um, you know, scenarios with those three features instead of you know, seven attributes. And then you can uh, even further refine the the importance of a feature of an intervention. Okay. So Thanks. to follow up with Mary Jane's question, do you know, Jay, is there a simple formula? You actually wrote a paper with me on this, and <laughs> you should be the one answering yeah. <laughs> well, Sounds like a factor analysis. Well, yeah. Do you know, is there a simple formula if you know, say, for example, I have seven attributes, how many combinations I need to come up with? A yeah, it's a, it's a fractional factorial thing. So it's like two to the seven hundred twenty-eight. So if you don't want any interactions, it comes out to be eight. eight to yeah. okay. I think seven is a lot. Yeah. Because right. your population basically all educate yeah. and can handle this. But for some population, you may not ha present too many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll get confused. It all depends on the intervention uh, design features. Yeah or a product, whether the product is an intervention or some yeah. biomedical uh, mm -hmm. device. Mm -hmm. And you know, seven could be a lot, but at the same time, if you don't capture you know, some, potential, some attribute that's inherently very important, mm -hmm. this is kind of meaningless because you, you know, missed a very important yeah. aspect mm -hmm. of an intervention or a product, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Thank you, Jay, for clarification. Uh, so uh, we are conducting the uh, conjoint analysis with uh, six hospital directors. So uh, for some 60, yeah, that's right. Uh, for sample size calculation, because uh, conjoint analysis is a, a semi-quantitative method, so there is no uh, legitimate way to calculate sample size. S but literature suggests that the uh, sample size of 50 would be enough, so uh, that's why I decided to include 60 hospital directors. The directors are recruited from uh, different levels and different types of uh, healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. Say for example, like uh, one there from provincial level, one there <coughs> from city level, one there from county level and some from generalized hospital, some from uh, specialized hospital, and some from uh, the hospitals uh, where the uh, WW intervention was originally conducted. So to uh, be eligible for this study, uh, the hospital has to be 18 years or, or above, that's for sure, and being a director or associate director of the selected hospitals. So the selection is based on uh, the leadership recommendation and if they have knowledge of the related uh, policy and practice. Uh, of course, this, this is voluntary and informed consent will be obtained. Uh, so uh, the conjoint analysis will be administrated uh, uh, on a one-on-one phase two phase base. So uh, our interviewer, will first introduce the WW intervention 
uh, to the participants, including the purpose, the design, and the outcome of this intervention. And then they will uh, present uh, a set of answer cards uh, of those scenarios <coughs> one by one to the participants. Then the participants will be asked to rate each scenario in terms of the possibility of adopting this intervention program in their hospitals. Uh, the ratings, it, it's like a five point rating from one equals to highly likely to five equals to highly unlikely. Uh, also at the end of questionnaire, we're gonna <coughs> query if this format of uh, assessment is easy to understand or if they can answer questions in a honest manner. So uh, this shows the answer cards. Uh, for uh, On each of the answer cards, there, there is a scenario and followed by the rating from uh, highly likely to highly unlikely. So uh, how to do a data analysis? So well, first we are gonna transform the five point rating to a, a zero to 100% acceptability score. Or it's a highly likely score is 100 and the highly unlikely score is zero. <laughs> And then for each respond, respondent, we are going to fit um, uh, multi, multiple regression, regression models uh, with the acceptability score as the dependent uh, variable and as uh, each of the attributes as independent variables. So uh, for uh, each individual, the regression coefficient for the attributes will be the impact score of their attribute. This is for individual uh, respondent. And then after you calculate the impact score for each individual, the we're gonna calculate the impact score of, a, of an attribute uh, by taking a difference between the mean acceptability score uh, and the of mean acceptability score of the preferred value uh, and the uh, acceptability score uh, of the non-preferred value. So um, also you can calculate the average of individual impress score to generate the impress mm -hmm. score of an in attribute. So we're gonna use like one sample t-test to determine the uh, significant level uh, one sample t test to compare the the impact score of preferred value or preferred uh, preferred attributes with the uh, unpreferred attributes. So once the uh, impact score and the uh, uh, impact score acceptability score is determined, we can uh, explore the relationship uh, between decision making with uh, multi-level factors, including individual level demographic uh, characteristics uh, and uh, hospital characteristics, and uh, also the perception of the uh, intervention, uh, perception of the inner and outer settings, as it's mm -hmm. listed here. So the directors are also gonna answer those yeah. C3 form Yeah. So, um, so this is pretty much about the conjoint analysis. So uh, the second method I'm gonna use uh, is bottleneck analysis to, uh, so it's bottleneck analysis, it's uh, originally a computer simulation method and later being used in healthcare ma management studies. So it's actually a very, very complex method. It involves a lot of computer simulation and stuff. So <coughs> here I'm gonna just present a very, very simpl simplified idea. So basically, <laughs> basically the, the aim is to identify the weakest link in the hospital system and also provide some information uh, on how to 
choosing a specific way to remove the bottleneck. So it's a case-oriented approach. Uh, so with uh, each of the hospital being a case, I'm going to select 12 hospitals to conduct bottleneck analysis. Each of the hospital uh, will be a case. So 12 hospitals um, will also be from like different, select from different levels and different types. So basically the idea is to uh, view the hospital system as a pipeline. So there is uh, a lot of uh, sequential, <coughs> sequential links uh, through the pipeline. Uh, if we study the uh, provision of universal precursion, uh, so the, the links could be, uh, s the first link could be the hospital level availability of universal precursion supply supplies. The second could be uh, the distribution of those supply to each department. And then the third could be accessibility of universal precursion supplies among the service providers. The four, fourth link will be the utilization, actually utilization of those universal precursion supplies. And the last will be the correct use of the supplies. <coughs> so, um, uh, so this is predetermined uh, based on literature review and the prior knowledge of the hospital system. But uh, we're going to conduct focus group uh, with uh, hospital stakeholders in each of the 12 hospitals to finalize the, the uh, hospital spe specific throughput in a graphical way. So once this is determined, we are going to measure, uh, quantify each of the link. So uh, we're going to, so each of the link will be quantified using uh, different methods. Say, for example, uh, we're going to conduct a uh, hospital stakeholder focus group and also uh, combine with hospital uh, stock documentations to quantify the hospital budget for uh, universal precursion supplies, the channel of uh, replenish, and the uh, price for <coughs> universal precursion supply, and also a location of the supplies in each department, the uh, uh, amount of supplies that's needed. Uh, basically, uh, well, this will be like hospital and department level data will be achieved from uh, hospital stakeholder focus group and the uh, uh, start documentation. And for the uh, individual, yeah. Quick question. Can you go back to the previous? So you said that the the links uh -huh. here mm -hmm. and the amount of bottleneck is predetermined based on like focus yeah. groups and yeah. So for example, in this case, it looks like number two, link two, is causing the most bottleneck in this case. No, this is just an example. Right. So using this as an example, I'm yeah. just wondering with the bottleneck. Are they kind of dynamic? Is it so? For example, if you identify a bottleneck, yeah. a link, and then concentrate on resolving mm -hmm. that bottleneck, and once that bottleneck gets resolved, mm -hmm. can other links that were once considered a good throughput um, have um, a bottleneck that yeah. you can pick up? Yeah. So how do you so how do you go about resolving? So this bottleneck. Uh, Analysis can be like conducted repeatedly. Okay. Once uh, after this run, there might be some new bottlenecks emerged, and then you can conduct the bottleneck analysis again to identify new bottlenecks and like solve new problems. Right. So, for example, you know, it looks like here the distribution is causing a bottleneck. So once yeah. you address that, and then once the distribution actually happens, you realize that people actually don't know how to use it. But prior to getting the stuff, you know, we assume that, yeah, they all know how to use it. But then mm -hmm. once the you know, stuff is available, mm -hmm. you realize that usage is actually a bottleneck. So for each round of bottleneck analysis, mm -hmm. you kind of quantify each link simultaneously. Okay. So assume other 
So uh, it's kind of an iterative bottleneck, mm -hmm. continuous bottleneck analysis. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, we're going to conduct service provider survey uh, and combine with staff uh, observation to quantify the amount of uh, universal precursion supplies needed versus fulfilled and their actual uh, universal precursion uh, compliance and the uh, correct usage of universal precursion supply. So uh, basically, the we are going to estimate the proportion of fulfillment through each of the link uh, using a Microsoft Excel based spreadsheet. So the links uh, with the least throughput rates will be identified as system bottlenecks. For example, in a certain hospital, uh, so the universal precursion supply availability is 50%. And 80% of the supply was timely distributed to the departments, and the actual SS is 40%, and then 10% of the provider actually used the supply, and 80% uh, uh, were used correctly. So the 10% will be identified as bottlenecks. And then after this step, uh, oh. I'm going to conduct some what if analysis to examine the impact of some hypothetical changes uh, in the UP throughput. Say, for example, if we include increase this number to uh, 80%, then what, what will happen? The, like, the capacity will be increased by what percentage? This can be uh, uh, realize using some computer softwares, but I am still studying it. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'm going to have more detail next time. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is pretty much about bottleneck analysis. And uh, here I uh, list some literatures for implementation science in general and conjoint analysis and bottleneck analysis. So uh, this study is funded by NIMH, and also the original Y code and uh, warm heart intervention is also funded by NIMH, and uh, it's conducted jointly with the uh, China CDC and the uh, Fujian Provincial CDC. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lili being the primary mentor of this care award and for providing continuous support and advice. And also uh, Dr. Sanjay Lee for the guidance in conjoint analysis. So this is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was a nice presentation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things with conjoint analysis is getting back to your example of the cell phone plan. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I don't really know how many minutes I'm going to want or some of those characteristics until I've used the cell phone for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think the same thing, thinking about someone involved in an in intervention, the administrator might not realize mm -hmm. what their real preferences are until they've gone through the intervention. Mm -hmm. So are there plans to maybe take those same people and look at them at the end? Maybe almost do a second conjoint analysis or see how their preferences oh. change? Uh, I don't actually plan to actually implement the intervention in those, hus in those hospitals. Uh, so originally, um, originally I uh, gave like a definite number for each of the attributes, say for example cost, I put 100 versus 500, 100 as cheap and 500 as expensive. But uh, then I talked to some uh, local people and they suggest me not to put the different num definite number in here. Instead, so because you think 500 is expensive, but it might not be expensive for the hospital directors, right? right? So sure. they suggest me to put like a relatively cheap, relatively expensive to, uh, yeah. Just uh, if they ask like what's expensive, then you just say uh, according, it's based on your perception, yeah. Yeah, it's 
uh, like continuation of the question. For example, for administrative support mm -hmm. or availability of technical support, um, aren't you afraid that, for example, this uh, 60 or whatever stakeholder are not the best people to know, uh, you know, this, um, if it's, you know, really present, for example, technical support, uh, because they have, may have completely different view from mm -hmm. their stuff. Yeah, so, b so that's why we choose the, the hospital director based on the leadership recommendation and, and their knowledge of this, the, this, the issue related to stigma, to policy. So uh, it's uh, basically the hospital uh, director or the deputy directors who are, are very familiar with this situa situation. So they know better than <laughs> others. Yeah, they yeah. know better. But for example, their staff may feel completely different. Yeah, but yeah, they are yeah. the considered the decision maker yeah. in the hospital. Yeah, they can be the bottom net. Yeah, they can <laughs> be the bottom <laughs> net. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you really need those people's endorsement to make yeah. this happen, yeah, sure. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, any other questions? <laughs> I think it's a, a thank you for your talk. I think it's a very important and interesting field. And I think the tools that you're proposing to use mm -hmm. to study implementation science, I think they're, they're interesting. And mm -hmm. I think when it comes to conjoint analysis, mm -hmm. I think it's a tool, yep. but it's, it's basically looking at people's intention to, mm -hmm. you know, for example, use the intervention in this case, mm -hmm. or people's intention to you know, use a product per se. So oftentimes, when it comes like Scott said, when it comes to actually using it, mm -hmm. uh, there could be a you know disconnect between their intention and the actual action. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important tool, but it's also important to know that it's only a tool to kind of gauge yeah. their intentions. And mm -hmm. once actually you know the intervention goes out to the field, mm -hmm. there might be other yeah. implementation challenges yeah. that we have to face that we haven't anticipated. Yeah. In, in, you know, before, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also I include the uh, 10 hospitals where the original intervention was implemented, so they have some uh, real experience of this, <coughs> uh, this intervention. So we're going to take that into consideration. Yeah, I, I think it's very important yeah. to do that because with, for people, they never experienced the yeah. intervention. Yeah. They don't really know yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. But but we have only 10 to be included, so it, it comes to the sample size issue again. <laughs> Here you have you come with uh, some very good introduction yeah. of this intervention. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a product, like yeah. a, you know, that type of uh, advertisement to, mm -hmm. to really show what yeah. you talk about. So yeah, so I conduct a, like a one day training to those uh, uh, field data collection team just to uh, teach them how to uh, present this uh, intervention in a proper way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we still have some time, so yeah. feel free to yeah. ask questions. Well, yeah, I was just going to ask about, uh, do you have some examples where uh, qualitative information was combined with quantitative mm -hmm. information in a really useful mm -hmm. way? I was mm -hmm. just thinking about some examples that would be interesting. Uh, see, for example, the quantitative outcome could be like uh, the system change, like to what percentage the system uh, was changed. And then the qualitative uh, study could provide some information on uh, why this change happened, how it happened, and any special event triggered the, the, uh, this system change happen and yeah things like just like some triangulation mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i can add on that yeah. because we did some venue based analysis mm -hmm. for the outcome mm -hmm. so for uh, intervention you know some hospitals do better than mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. so if you look at the structure of the hospital if you look at the mm -hmm. staff training of the hospital that can provide some information mm -hmm. but we're not go to the lab where mm -hmm. uh, Chun Jin will go to that mm -hmm. deep. And, and so that can be the supplemental yeah. knowledge yeah. you can gain. 
So yeah, uh, that analysis identifies some factors associated with uh, the outcome. Say, for example, the outcome is more significant in small hospitals with uh, uh, fewer service providers. But there might be more factors that's uh, not identified. So we need to do this to uh, provide more information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, thanks very much for coming. So feel free to fill out the evaluation form and you can put it in the envelope in the front of us. You can announce the next uh, seminar. So for our November seminar, it's going to be on Tuesday the 18th. And we'll have Dr. Scott Camalata presenting on social network, um, analyzing social network data. No, actually, missing data. Missing <laughs> mobile phone <laughs> data. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the title of your talk? I don't have a title yet, but it's basically addressing missing data in ecological momentary assessment studies where we measure people on a daily basis. For well, mobile it's phone? Very, it can be a mobile phone or any daily assessment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good.